the far right radical arm of feminism is, uh, yeah, it's got nothing good to say about men. And so I lost a few friends when I did the Fuck Gillette uh, series, not series. I did a couple of videos, Fuck Gillette, one was a phone call with Tom McConnell. And um, I have people telling me, I, I thought I knew you and all this kind of stuff. No, traditional masculinity is lacking and it's sorely needed in society today. And it's one of the things I'm most interested in as our youth continue to be plagued with issues, uh, number one being an opioid epidemic, uh, epidemic that we can't seem to solve or we don't have the political will to solve. So Paul David Eskew will be Friday, 1045. If you're looking for life hacks or you're feeling stuck or you don't have a good grasp on technology or I don't know, you're interested in micro dosing, uh, psilocybin mushrooms or LSD or something like that. I can't, I don't know. Never considered microdosing. CBDs, THC, anything like that. Anyways, uh, we had a decent conversation a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to go deeper with Paul for another hour, Friday, 1045 EST here. He probably will be in Vancouver. Paul David Eskew is on my channel. If you just search it and you like what you see there, come back and see us Friday at noon. We'll be live right here, and we'll be talking. Uh, yeah, you know, life hacks and things like that. So, um, and then tomorrow at noon, I think I'm going to have a guest on tomorrow at noon who happens to be a developer and a competitive uh, uh, sharpshooter, target shooter, handgun enthusiast. I don't know. Again, if you're following me on Twitter, you can find out who I'm talking about. I, I should probably just say it, but I'm not prepared. I don't have the information right in front of me at the moment. So, And then uh, Saturday, I'm going to hang with Jihad Yahia. G Sharp Yahia, as he goes by. His band is called Road Waves. He's a good friend of mine. He's been on tour for the summer. You're probably getting ready to head out on 2020 tour. I think they might have played their first gig of the 2020 tour already. Road Waves is a solid jam band in Niagara. And uh, G Sharp Yahia is uh, one of my good buddies and I haven't been able to catch up with him lately. So we're going to sit down Saturday and um, uh, he'll probably play a few tunes acoustic, but I, I just want to, I just want to get caught up with him and hang with him. So that's basically what we will be doing Saturday. The band is road waves. You can catch them on YouTube. They just released a new single over here on the tube. Um, road waves is two words and you can find them on Facebook. I think he's on Instagram. He is on Twitter. He doesn't participate that much on Twitter. I think Instagram's maybe where he's spending a lot of his time. The guy can play, man. He can play guitar like nobody's business. He's a younger guy, but under 25, I would think for sure. I've known him a long time now because I met him, I think he was like 20. Yeah, so he's probably about 25 now. G Sharp Yahia, Saturday. Uh, I think we could probably say safely say that noon would be a good target date for that. So Thursday we get some. We'll be live tomorrow with a guest I'll announce later. Friday, Paul David Eskew, part two of our talk on life hacks, microdosing, technology, and here comes Vez. What up, Vesna? Look at you. Can you hear me? Hey, I can hear you. I can see you. All right. What's going on? Much my brother, thanks for taking this thing down just a little bit so that it's not got the top of my head. Look at how clean your office is, dude. I know it's cool, eh? <laughs> You're having company coming over, you went and cleaned up for me. Oh, god, <laughs> we got one more thing to move here. <laughs> well, look at the cat right there. In the th and then we got Mr. Mr. Cat show in the box. You're watching the show, Mr. <laughs> or you're gonna have him go for a stroll. That thing hasn't missed a meal in a while, huh? No, Mr. Mister loves food. Yeah. Food is his second favorite thing in the world. <laughs> his favorite thing in the world is sleep. <laughs> yeah. Right, Mr. Mister? What, ha what happened to his tail, Vess? Uh, he got it caught in a door somewhere. He broke his back. Oh, gee. And he had uh, his tail cut off. He's lucky he, his, um, his, he functions. Right. Because usually when they've got a catastrophic injury like that, they don't oh, okay. they don't come back. 
So what's up, Mr. Mister? What are you doing? Uh, nothing. I wanted to catch up with you. Uh, my first uh, question is the same as it was to you yesterday. Uh, if I run for the leadership of the Green Party of Canada, will you be my con my uh, campaign manager? Uh, sure, as long as you don't mind the leader of the none of the above party running your campaign. Yeah, how did that work out for you last time around? Uh, well, I didn't get registered, right? Oh, so I ran as an independent. Oh, okay, did you? Yeah, so. All right. But anyway. I already got two candidates in the Ottawa by-elections in February, so. Nice, nice. So we'll see. Uh, what's your reaction to the most recent uh, federal election? Did you predict it? And what do you think of the outcome? Uh, Canadians are fools. Um, what a joke. What do you, how do you, come how on? Do you, how, how do you contrast it to the rest of the world seemingly right now rejecting far, you know, socialism and far leftism and stuff like that? Hi, Kathy. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> and, and then, uh, and then Canada gives them a second term with, uh, it, it seems even a more socialist agenda with the, you know, the, the NDP having some power. I guess everyone will have some power now, I guess, the way it's working in the minority government. If they want to stay alive, they need to placate everyone, I guess. Well, yeah, but there's a lot of bullshit here too, right? Media hype and all the rest. I mean, here's the bottom line. The Bloc Quebecois controls the government of Canada. Does any, if anybody thinks that they're going to have an election, they're out of their mind. The Bloc is going to let the Liberals go four years and 364 days because they control the government agenda. Look, the leader of the bloc yesterday opens this trap about the approval of the, of the pipeline from Alberta to BC. Like, it doesn't affect him and his province and Quebec as a country or a nation or anything else. And there he is chirping, chirping away, why? Because the deal he made with Trudeau is He'll support Trudeau on everything except pipelines because Trudeau made a deal with the conservatives that they're gonna support Trudeau on pipelines. So we de facto have a liberal majority government for four more years. Hmm. That's the way it is. And what, what, are you, what are your thoughts on, like I said, it seems like all around the world, uh, it, it, they seem to be leaning right more. And then uh, even with all the scandals that were plaguing Trudeau up until this, you know, is, are we just a more left-leaning voting public in Canada than the rest of the world, or are we just slow to the party? I don't want to be unkind to my fellow citizens, okay, but uh, God, there's some bad words I could use. Uh, to say that we are any more intelligent voters than the Trump supporters and the Trumpeteers, uh, although they support a different bent, um, would put it mildly. Look, Look, uh, the Conservatives lost the election. Truly did not win the election, okay? The electoral system failed us again. A Liberal again promised us to do it differently and turned out to be as bigger, bigger liar than the previous liar we defeated because of the liar we defeated before the liar we defeated before that liar. OK, you don't have to go back to Daddy Trudeau to find the first liberal that said, I believe in proportional representation and blah, 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 blah. blah. No, go back to 1921. <laughs> the liberals won a big majority promising. Wait for it. Wait for it. Proportional representation. OK, I mean, Kathleen Wynne promises to do politics differently. Well, she kept that promise. She just didn't do them better. Kim Campbell promised to do politics differently. Can't do much with two seats, especially when you don't win your own. So the bottom line is we have an electoral system that makes a liar out of everyone because the only goal in our system is to get elected. It's not to actually pass the policies that your members have voted on and uh, you've campaigned on in 12 elections. As soon as you get power, it's over. That's it. The prime minister's office, the leader's office, controls the complete agenda, and for the people is out the door. There you go. So until we change that, we're wasting our time. Which is why I've given up on party politics entirely, and I'm running the none of the above party, the none of the above direct democracy party, which will eventually brand when people know that NADA is none of the above as the direct democracy NADA party. 
because we want people to understand that there's a big difference between representative democracy and direct democracy. Representative democracy is supported by 82% of the people in the world, and they want to elect people to represent them. Okay? Direct democracy, and that's across all the political spectrum. Direct democracy is supported by 66% of the people in the world across all of the democracies uh, because they understand giving people control, giving people a hammer is what makes the system work. And what's interesting is in the United States, they have referenda laws and, and plebiscites, et cetera, et cetera, in every state. So, you know, the one thing that Mike Harris won his majority on was I'll keep my promises and I'll pass a citizen's referenda bill to make sure that I and all that follow will keep their promises too, right? That's what he said. And he got the big majority and drafted a bill. I was in committee with, with him. Okay, we drafted a bill, we circulated it, we went to town halls all over the province. And one of the you know kids in short pants in the premier's office said, Hey Mike, if you pass this bill, they're gonna have a referendum on amalgamating Toronto, they're gonna want a referendum on your 25% welfare cuts, they're gonna drive us nuts. And I said, Mike, they need signatures, it takes a year to initiate one of these things. Look at your own draft bill. Even if they do manage to get votes on one or two of your policies, they're going to be so focused on that that you can do anything else you want, absolutely anything else, and they can do anything about it. And when you come to get reelected, you can say, I kept every promise I made, like I said I would, except the ones that you asked me not to keep. Da -da. There it is. So that's the difference. I think that party party politics is over. I don't think that whoever the leader is following the leader to the slaughterhouse of defeat, because that's the end game, it does anything for anybody. And there's a reason why uh, less than 2% of Canadians are members or ever have been members or have ever contributed to a political party, and 60% of Americans have. And I'll tell you the reason. Because at least in their system, money talks. At least you can get something done there. If the parties won't do it, you can initiate it yourself. Here, forget it. So you've been in and out of the party system trying to get things done within the parties, and you've been in all the part. Well, did you work with the NDP? I guess you did in some capacity when Simon. Well, no, out. I actually uh, I never worked for the NDP. Uh, the one the one time they needed yep. my help was when our friend, the late Simon DeYoung, ran for the leadership, and I gave him a bunch of policies what he used, and I said, "Let me help you." And he said, "Oh God, if they ever find out that Vez is involved with me, uh, I'll come last. I'll do worse than John Gamble, who he and his wife were delegates and." Uh, and John got one vote. Mm. Anyway, so no, no. So Simon wouldn't let me uh, help him. But uh, I helped the Liberals uh, when Dalton, I helped uh, convince Dalton to run on the campaign promise to support PR and to hold a referendum uh, in favor of it and to support the campaign in favor. And so I helped him. I was going to run for the nomination in my own writing, Mississauga. Good old Greg Sorbera called me up and said, please stay in the background, don't do it. Uh, we'll, 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 make, we'll make it up to you. Yeah, okay, sure, sure. So anyway, yeah, so after three terms of Dalton, uh, I ran as a delegate and Kathy and my son Alex uh, in the convention, Kathy and I ran for, uh, oh, I forget. Anyway, and our son ran for uh, Kathleen Wynn. She won, uh, tried to get through to the party. It was just a joke. Then she started appointing candidates in Niagara Falls twice rather than have an open nomination. Frank Rasso wanted to run and campaign on ammonia as a liberal policy. Uh, they blocked. And then as you recall, two weeks into the 2014 election, I just said, you know what? When's nominations close? In three days. Okay start a party and we ran eight candidates four of them were business but hey you got to do what you got to do uh and then by 2018 we ran 42 candidates in 30 percent of the ridings so we're technically the fastest growing party in the last hundred years in ontario 
uh, we've accomplished in two elections, two to 42 or eight to 42, what well, took the Greens four and the Libertarians five. And I expect in the next election, we'll run in every right. So there it is. What's your take on the state of the Greens these days? You know, I've got a soft spot for them. I, you know, back in 2006, when we ran in that leadership campaign, it was, it was a great time, a weird time. And, and I was just saying the other day on one of my uh, uh, casts that it was the most, out of all the elections I was in, the Green Party leadership bid was the most political thing I've ever been involved with. Like you had camps on all sides and I don't need to go back in history, but um, you know, we in recruiting Elizabeth to the show. I think that was sorely needed at the time. They, she's legit. Well, I don't help to legitimize the party. I mean, in 93, when you called and said, Hey, I need a guy because we want to keep the party alive. We need 50 candidates. And I said, yes, as long as I don't have to do anything. And then went on see how for my first interview and wet the chair literally uh, and went for my voice and it wasn't there. Never forgotten that. So, I mean, you're an important guy in my life, just the recruiting of that. And then I stayed away from it for a long time. I think I came back in 2006, eight. You ran, you ran for the leadership. Uh, well, yeah, I ran, but I had a, a bunch of other uh, green party, but anyways, um, the most political thing I ever done, ever done, but now, you know, what is it, uh, 2014 years later, they haven't even had a discussion about leadership. Well, and I Jim, start feeling, I start feeling like, oh, 2006 was a great time. I remember, you know, Katie Holloway and all the crew and all the, the politics. And the, I don't think I've got the guts for it now. But then I go, I download the PDF of the rules. I didn't get far through it before I saw on one of the Facebook groups. I think it's an unofficial Green Party group. 50k to yep. run so then I, yep. oh, well, I could i could run 50k is only a thousand bucks times 50 people that it can't be that hard oh and the green contributors oh they got thousand dollars to throw away a lot of them do i've got the support base that could there are 50 members in the party that have a thousand dollars to throw away for crying out loud well let's get back to the whole point here uh and i just watched your speech the other day your concession speech the other day you posted that, look, what happened to the Green Party? All of the things that you said, let's take out the laundry, let's bring in the broom, let's stop this, stop that, stop this. Well, guess what? They all got far worse than they were before, okay? Uh, it isn't the Green Party, it's the Elizabeth May Party. You go to the party website and go look at the history of the dozens and dozens of prominent Canadians that were involved in the Green Party before Elizabeth May, it's gone, disappeared. It's all about Lizzie May and the small party. She succeeded in one thing. She kept the Green Party as a small party. That's what she accomplished. And that's the truth. The party spent the last 16 years entirely focusing on electing Elizabeth May, period. No democracy, no, no leadership review after elections. Constitution isn't democratic. The party is no more democratic than it was when I left it. And I left it because of the show, the circus that the party was. Look, look on its environment policy. The Green Party is in favor of a net zero by 2050. Okay, how are we gonna get there? Net zero by 2050, starting today, we have to build one nuclear plant every day for the next 10,000 days. <laughs> or 2 million uh, square feet of solar every day for the next 10,000 days, okay? And we're going to leave those 170 billion barrels of oil in the ground. Wow. We mine every drop of coal in China and every drop of tar sands in Venezuela. Well, look, okay, the Green Party is more dishonest on its environmental and economic policies than the conservatives are. And that takes a lot to say that. Because we know the truth is in today's conservative party, the only good Tory is a suppository, right? Well, I gotta come up for a lie because the only good green today reminds me of that mucus guy, that little blob on the TV commercials. Let's tell the truth, for fuck's sakes, pardon my language. Okay, look, I am an original green. 
I'm an original environmentalist. I converted vehicles to run on ammonia 40 years ago, okay? And all I've said all along is, let's use basic science and math. Let's use the things that our politicians tell us they're using, but they don't. $25 million to Loblaws for their refrigerators. I mean, give me a break. Mulroney promised to end the subsidies to oil and gas, and so did Daddy Trudeau. This Trudeau promised to do it. He exempted methane until 2030, uh, and he exempted all gas plants built before 2023, and all built after as long as no more than a third of the power goes on the grid. Come on. He has a tax on the 20, 10 to 20 percent of carbon that the big emitters are not exempted from. And there's no life cycle clean fuels policy on the pollution from battery vehicles or the pollution from growing food to make fuel. That's all exempted. This guy is so full of shit, it's unbelievable. He makes Lion Brian Moroni look like Mother Teresa. He makes Donald Trump look honest. That's how bad this guy is. Tell the friggin' truth. Yes, Trans Mountain's gonna get built. Yes, Keystone's gonna get built. Yes, Line 3 and Line 9 and Line 5 are all gonna get built. Why? Because we have a third of the world's oil reserves and they're going to market. And China is going to make sure they go to market because we signed a trade deal with China with a 30 year out clause and private arbitration. So China will bill Canada $500 billion. They'll bankrupt us under the trade agreement if we don't let the oil that they own from the companies that have invested in Canada get their friggin' oil to market. End of story. Wow. So look, all I've asked for for the last 40 years is honesty. Stop subsidizing oil and gas. Stop sizing select renewables. Stop subsidizing nuclear and put the real cost of pollution in the price of energy and everything else for that matter and have a user pay economy. If I don't pollute, I don't pay. If I pollute, I do pay. I don't make my children or grandchildren or children in Africa that are, are mining lithium or you know children in somewhere else that are using palm oil like or slave labor okay, in the Congo to get cobalt, okay, come on. Let's be honest. Let's use science to, to, to find out what the consequences from cradle to grave of what we're doing are, and then let's put the price of that, the cost to society of that, in the jurisdiction where it's happening. We import batteries from China with no environmental cost in China or here in Canada, for crying out loud. We import Saudi oil, but we carbon tax our own. Like, okay, so I just want a level playing field. Everything is clear, the rules are the same, and then I can tell the consumers that my product costs X amount of dollars, and it costs to cause uh, Y amount of pollution. You know what the consumer will care about? The X amount of dollars. They don't give a shit how much pollution it is. Everybody cares about the environment until you tell them it's going to cost them more than a dollar to, to fix it. They don't want to pay for it. And the, the reality is, is we're paying two, three, four, five times the cost of the mitigation technologies by blowing money, giving grants to oil companies and grants to battery vehicles and so on. Look, for every ton of CO2 we get rid of, with a $5,000 battery vehicle subsidy, that costs us $200 per ton. But you can get rid of carbon for $15 a ton in a hundred other ways. So we're paying you know, 15 to 20 times the cost of getting rid of carbon in battery subsidies 
and we're and we're ignoring all the other pollution associated with battery vehicles, increased tire wear, in, you know, increased brake wear, and so on and so on. My point is, I'm not against renewables. I'm not against new technologies. I'm against subsidizing something that, in many cases, is worse than what we're doing, and is far worse than other things we have that are better, which can't enter the marketplace because their competitors are subsidized, period. Prime Minister says we have a price on pollution. I say bullshit. Quote one on all pollution, exempt nothing. Prime Minister says we use science. He didn't even appoint his committee to study the impact of his policies and his blasting billions of dollars away, and it won't even report till 2025. He promised us a life cycle clean fuels policy to match the carbon tax in 2016. 10 years later, they're not even gonna have the friggin' report. And they're exempting 90% of the things that should be included. The rest of the world has realized that using food to make fuel is probably not a smart thing. Even Al Gore 10 years ago said, ah, probably wasn't a good idea. Uh, but Donald Trump, Oh, I want that farm vote. Trudeau, Doug Ford, I want that farm vote. So what are they doing? They're increasing the minimum mandate of alcohol fuels from 5 to 10%. Our average in Ontario is about 9% of fuels is ethanol uh, to 15%. And yet the automobile manufacturers say, if you go beyond 10%, you destroy mm. our carburation system. You destroy our electronics, our vehicles, our ECUs, and blah, 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 blah unless the vehicle is purposely built as a flex fuel vehicle. The government still listen. and they don't give a shit. Consumers can pay. Ah, oh, you can file claims against the auto companies for warranty claims and go sue them. You have fun. We're gonna go get those votes in Iowa and we're gonna increase and we're gonna get those votes in London and in, you know, in, in, in mid-Ontario because we want uh, to subsidize something that is worse than diesel fuel. And this is the thing, okay? The government said they do their stuff on science. Well, the land use impact of taking fertile agricultural land out of production and producing fuel is greater. The carbon impact, et cetera, the ozone impact, et cetera, et cetera. That one alone of the life cycle emissions of the seven majors, you know, ozone, uh, methane, CO2, uh, uh, um, ammonia, et cetera, et cetera, of all the pollutants that you can get, uh, um, nitrous oxides, et cetera. That one is a killer, okay? And so, and, and so what are we doing? Oh, Ontario and Canada and U.S. are increasing it. The rest of the world is eliminated. It takes 125% of energy in ethanol to fuel a farm tractor and to make it. You've lost 25% before you even start using the shit. It's no cleaner than diesel fuel. So again, my rant is that I want everything that we do based on science and math. I want decisions made on science, not nonsense. And that's the problem. Politics today is about nonsense. As our environment, former environment minister said, you just say it loud enough, often enough, and they'll oh. believe you. That's the same thing Goebbels said in 1939 in Nazi Germany. So that's what we live in. And the conservatives, you know, there was good old Andrew Scheer, the guy with the only policy that actually made any sense, and there was only one thing wrong with it. He exempted industry 70% instead of Trudeau's 80 to 90. His policy was every nickel that I collect in tax, I won't return to consumers. I will spend it with industry developing technologies to reduce emissions, not only here, but technologies we can export all over the world. Ding, 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 ding. And so let's look at just for one more second. I'll rant a little more. Let's look at the real math now. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, let's say, okay, so let's say you have a $20 a ton carbon tax and you want to make a ton of ammonia out of natural gas. And when you make that natural gas, it'll create two tons of CO2, which 
get vented in the atmosphere in 99 or 95% of the ammonia piles in Canada. So on a, ten, a $20 a ton carbon tax, the carbon tax on that ton of ammonia is $40. The cost to take that two tons of CO2 when it's separated in the Haber synthesis process and convert it into urea carbamide, which is a combination of carbon and ammonia, which is a fertilizer, to convert it into char, which is carbon, or carbon black, which can be used for carbon nanotubes, or can be just buried in the ground for 500 million is $30 a ton, is $15 a ton. So the cost not to emit that carbon making ammonia is $10 cheaper than the cost to emit it. <laughs> ah, but Juno gave you a 90% exemption. Oh, just wait a minute now. Let's get my green nine math going again. And let's just figure that out. So, so it's now $4 a ton to emit it. Oh, and $15 a ton, uh, sorry, $30 a ton not to me, $30 for a ton of ammonia made. Oh, and when does it get cheaper not to emit it than it is to emit it under Trudeau's carbon tax? When the carbon tax gets to $160 a ton. I, I rest my case. End of friggin' story. So our government is making sure that industry will not reduce emissions until at least 2030. And the Liberals said they're not going to increase the carbon tax in 2025 from 50, even though the Bank of Canada said, and, and the committee they put together said, we need a $200 a ton carbon tax. Well, a $200 a ton carbon tax, you pay me $200 for every ton of ammonia I make where I don't emit carbon. <laughs> you pay me. But no, 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 no. You get it? So I want that good old, uh, yeah, I love that TV show, Who's Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? because the fifth graders were smarter than 99.9% .9 of voters and adults watching the friggin' show, okay? So I think we should be governed by fifth graders. Fifth grade science, fifth grade math. That's what we need. We should stop electing politicians and we should have a lottery and we should pick out fifth graders <coughs> from the provinces across Canada Send them to Ottawa for a year and let them run the country. That's a great idea. Uh, okay, so adapting. If you had it your way and we had full cost accounting, how do we adapt to a, a, when with supply and demand the way it is now? How do you adapt to a six dollar liter of petrol to put in? Well, but did you see it? But you see that, and there's the lie. And the lie is that you you, you know we go from from no cost for pollution to doubling the cost of energy. And that curve doesn't happen on a linear line up and down or even across. It's like this, okay? And the reason is as follows. We use the trade agreements that we have to defeat the advantage of imports and the disadvantage of exports. And we simply say this, our carbon tax supplies, and it's an environment tax, not just a carbon tax. So half the price is made up of carbon. The other half will be made up of the other environmental pollutions, methane, da-da-da-da-da-da. But our environment tax, our cost of pollution applies to everything. There are no exemptions anywhere. Nobody. Mr. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. You want to get in on the meeting? And Mr. Mr. wants in on the meeting. Uh, Mr. Yeah, somebody just commented, please feed the cat. Okay, all right, he's happy now. All right, there we go. Cat's gone. So anyway, so back to the so so um so so let's say in my world you end up with a you know you you end up with a ten dollar uh, a ton pollution tax. Okay. Now it applies to everybody, okay. And so in doing that, what happens is, is you don't drastically increase the price of fuel. 
You don't drastically increase the price of home heating, et cetera, et cetera. But what you do is, is you provide the money to adapt the new technologies because it is going to cost us literally trillions of dollars to replace the oil and gas infrastructure. Oil and gas is 80% of the world's energy. And the world's use of energy has gone up 30% in the last 10 years since the last recession. And renewables can't fill the gap. <laughs> they can't even keep up right now. So the truth is, is that we're going to be using oil and gas for the next 50 years. There's no question. So what we got to do is we got to implement the best available technologies. We've got to make it economic to do the right thing instead of economic to do the wrong thing. And that's really how it, how, how it would work and how it's all about. So we would say to imports, if your country doesn't have the same $10 environment tax that we have, uh, we're taxing your imports. And if we're sending Canadian oil to a country that doesn't have any environment tax, no problem. We're not charging it. So if you want to be an environment raping scumbag, we're not going to let our environment tax stop our industry from selling stuff to you, you environment raping scumbag. However, everything that your economy produces that you try to export, we're going to tax the shit out of. So it's like the old argument we used to have when we had a sales tax in Ontario. And Ontario manufacturers paid 13% extra uh, as a manufacturer's tax. So when we wanted to sell something in New York State, they could compete with us on the 13% tax. So we got rid of that. We said, we'll get rid of that. And now we'll go to an, uh, an HST, a GST HST. And so now our industries could compete on a level playing field. They didn't have this disadvantage, okay? Uh, and then what we did was we get into all this global trading with transnational companies, and we said, well, only some of you have to pay sales tax in Canada, and only some of you have to pay income tax, and it depends how good your lawyers and accountants are. Because if you are Facebook, and if you are Google, and if you are Amazon, Anything you sell in Canada is GST, HST free. Oh, and that income tax that Canadian companies pay? Well, we understand your corporate head office is in Ireland or in the case of Apple, somewhere in space, not in the country. And so you don't pay tax in Canada. And so we have the same sort of bullshit going on in the oil and gas and in the energy business. And then we use government subsidies to subsidize wind and solar in Ontario. Uh, at twice to three times the cost of other technologies for 20 years. And all those contracts are owned by Europeans and foreign companies, you know. So the answer to that is to create a level playing field. And where we're doing business and they have no environmental policies or comparable policies, not a problem. We'll sell you all the tar sands you can take, okay? But you try and export a piece of cloth, a grain, a grain, a single grain of food crop, a tire, a battery, a radio, anything into Canada, and we're hammering you back the environment tax. And it won't take long for uh, industry to realize that what they should do is rather than trying to externalize the environmental costs of their production, it's got to be time to internalize it. And that's why you're seeing some of the biggest companies on earth are changing their attitudes, you know, like including the biggest hedge funds like BlackRock, who are now saying, you got to have the social, economic, and environmental costs you got to have sustainability in your business model because we know inevitably if you do not have it, what is going to happen to your company or your sector? It's going to be gone. And we control trillions and trillions of dollars of very rich people's money and they don't like to lose. So there's the answer, Jim. You take the policy, you domesticate it, 
you exempt it where the imports are harming you unfairly, you use that as an advantage. You use the trade agreements as an advantage that exists. And then you just let these people try and compete in a marketplace where their products are different prices in every place, depending on where their raw materials come from and where they export. And they themselves will have to come to the conclusion, their industry will force them to come to the conclusion that we're getting hammered in all these different markets under all these different rules, red tape, we'll call it. And industry will force them to play fair. How's what, that for a dream? <laughs> yeah. So what's got to happen to give us the political will or the accountability to break the system the way it's designed now in North America, let's say? I think, it's I think it's happening. Uh, I think it's happening uh, by attrition. There's a there's a, a sociological there's many sociological studies, but there's a general uh, understanding in soci sociology that as soon as you get 10% of the population agreeing on something, agreeing on a policy, that it's inevitable that that policy will be adopted by the masses. So we're what we're long we're long past the point where 10% of the population care about pollution, okay. Uh, uh, and want carbon pricing and blah, blah, blah. But we're just reading, reaching the point where 10% of them are willing to pay for it. And that's the secret. Okay, yeah. You got, you got to get them to accept it economically. So that, that's sort of where we're at. And I think we're getting there. And I think, look, you know, look, you know, you see my, I write a lot, you know, in the sun and, and, and all life and other places. And, and I lecture and speak and I talk about beware of false green profits. And false green profits come from the oil industry just as much as they come from the green industry, right? So, you know, my whole point is, is that if people actually knew what was going on, if they actually knew the truth, okay, not the BS from the extreme left or the BS from the extreme right or the ex climate extremism that says that the temperature is rising everywhere at the same time. I mean, I did a great article six months ago where I had 21 countries where their media had said that the te temperature is rising double the world average in everywhere at the same time. As long as we're listening to people, to, 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 to 10 year olds or 13 year olds that fly around the world, or, or, or sorry, fly, sail around the world, telling us that we've ruined their future. If it wasn't for oil and gas, there wouldn't be a future for them. We wouldn't even exist. We'd still be in the Stone Age. Okay. So as long as we have this rhetoric, this extreme bullshit from either the right wing that says, burn it, bomb it, boil it, oil it, you know, or the left wing that says, oh, we got to get to zero by 2050 exactly. uh, there's no 12 year old there's no eight year old there's no grade fiver in the middle that says uh teacher who's full of shit here that's what we need <laughs> it almost seems though i mean it, you look at the states and they're wasting all this time on uh, on an impeachment process meanwhile our kids are dying in the streets from you know chinese fentanyl and We've got so many issues facing us today, and the humans never seem to be the type of uh, of creature that really acts on anything until they're painted into a corner, until they have no, right. you know, it, you know, the ozone yeah. hole. We, yeah. we we took action against that. I'm not sure because yeah, we were ten years away from dying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So and now we've seen so many of these dire predictions not happen. You know, the glacier is still there. They had to change the sign. You know, this whole idea that it's in 12 years, it's going to be irreversible damage. Well, like we've heard enough of the extremism. Uh, the problem is, is the moderate science and the consensus that's in the middle for the vast majority of the science. And I'm no expert on this, but <clears throat> I'm certainly doesn't have as loud a voice as the extremists do, especially AOC in the states saying it's all over in 12 years. And then you get Greta, you know, parroting that. And now, but hey. Dude, we've come a long way, and this, I don't know if some of my own hope comes from, we've been talking about this since 93 and before. For me, 93, my first election, right? 
And now, I mean, everyone ridiculed me when I was a Green Party guy in 93. Nobody had heard of it. Nobody knew what a carbon fee and dividend was. Still, they're not getting it right in the implementation of it all around well, Canada anyways. Um, now it's so cool to be green. Now these eco-fascists and these, I see the Green Party uh, attempting to position themselves as eco-socialists. Yeah, well, I, see, I think it's, there's a big wide open space there. Now it's yeah. so trendy to be green. So, I mean, what's the, what's the adaptation period in your mind? You, you know the science. I mean, we're both not experts on it, but you, I mean, you've studied it a lot more. So, well, realistically, we What's started, we, I ran as the first green candidate in 1983, okay? Uh, a founding candidate. In fact, I was brought in by Trevor Hancock, the then leader. I'd, uh, I'd left the Conservative Party. I was a Peter Pocklington for leadership delegate. And I supported Peter Pock, and people always called me a Tory plant ever since. But I supported Peter because of two policies. One a flat tax. No more hiding your money in the Grand Caymans, boys and girls. We're going to nail you on global income, 15%, 20%. Here's your tax form, gross net tax. It'll come to you on a postage card, send it in. If you cheat, the penalty is 500%. People didn't see that part of his policy. We were going to make these cheating, lying bastards homeless. Right? So second was, no more grants and subsidies to the industry. Not a cent. No more tax incentives. No more sweet deals. No more loan guarantees. No more nothing. If you're in business and you can't make money, too bad. We're not subsidizing. Do you know how much money we've blown in subsidies since 1983, my friend? You know? A trillion dollars of the trillion and a half we have in that debt is just in grants and subsidies. Give me a pin break, okay? So, so anyway, I had a, the day Mulroney won the leadership, I resigned from the Conservative Party. I knew exactly what was coming. And there's a long story there, but anyway. Okay, so uh, I get a, call, a phone call from Dr. Hancock, and he says, uh, I understand you might be interested in running for us in Ottawa. And I said, who are you? <laughs> anyway, he explained to me they had this guy named John Turmel, mm. who had walked into Ottawa and nominated him and his uncle and his mother and his cousin and his brother. and. And, and some other people as the green candidates for all the ridings in Ottawa. And uh, if those nominations stand, it's over for the party before we even start. Hmm. Now, John Tremel's claim to fame is, beside the fact that he's a gambler, uh, he believes in science and he wears a white hard hat and he has a floppy disk and he pounds off his head and says, you don't understand me, you're a low tech and you're stupid. And that's... And he's run in more elections, lost more elections than anybody. He has a Guinness World Record. Uh, and, and, and if you don't agree with him, then he just insults you and blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, and I, uh, I thought, oh, Jesus, Jesus. And I have a reputation, of course, and was very well known as the guy that called up Peter Pockling and said, hey, I want to be your organizer in Ontario. Why don't you fly in and we'll go to all these hockey towns in Northern Ontario and thousands of people will come out to see you and we'll win all the delegates. And I won half of the hundred delegates that he won on the first ballot for him in Northern Ontario. So, you know, we knew our base, we went after it. So anyway, the word was out, there's a Globe article, blah, blah, blah. So Hancock says, come on in and get your shoe shit. Get rid of this fucking guy. And I said, well, you know, we're going to have to obey the Constitution and blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, there are challenges in the Constitution to get rid of this guy. But, uh, and I said, well, I'll do what I'm going to do, but I don't want to ever hear from the party that what I did was not legal. I don't care what it takes. Because at the end of the day, if that comes up, I'm going to say I was instructed by the leader to nuke this guy. So I'll nuke him democratically, but whatever happens, happens. Dr. Hancock said, you know, basically, I'll be your bullshit protector. Just do it because 
We can't have this guy insulting the whole world in the first election we run. And the media will go crazy. And he was, of course, right. So anyway, yeah. So we nuked Trammell. We had a meeting to hold a meeting, to have a meeting to decide whether we're going to have a meeting to overturn the nomination meeting. And we had 72 hours to do that. And then within 48 of hours we had of that, we had to have a second meeting. And then within 14 days of that, we had to have a new nomination meeting. And we had to do all that uh, one day before nominations closed. And we did it. And I, I ran and we ran candidates and all the writings. And so that, you know, that was my experience with the Greens. And the Greens were, in, you know, back then, with the, it was the European Green Bond, right? It was, you know, we wanted consensus wherever, po wherever possible. Um, but our policies, there was a big direct democracy bet in the Greens back there, where back then, where the people had their own say. And some of it the Greens have carried through today, including being the only party that has a none of the above option in electing all of its party executives or leaders. When they vote, they mm -hmm. have that option. But right. the Green Party, as you know, after Elizabeth May came on board, changed and its focus became on electoral politics and rhetoric more than it was on reality. And that's, it became another follow the leader party. So getting back to the science of this all, adapting seems to be the, the you know, uh, it's always been the number one word for me because you can't, I mean, you can't stop what's coming in the next 50 years. We've already done what we've done. Even, I mean, I guess the bounce back is, is quick. We noticed that when we stopped putting lead in the air, you know, the canopy in California, yeah. the thing exploded. Yeah. But yeah. then also the, the fear tactic is, you know, 12 years, it's irreversible. So what type of yeah, time? That's bullshit. Okay. Yeah. It's look, look, let's go again. I just take a minute and be honest for a second and talk about some real science. 100% <clears throat> of the harm from CO2 takes place between zero and 500 years. 100% of the harm from methane takes place from zero to 25 years. And it's 84 times as bad as CO2 during that time period. And we have a carbon tax on uh, 10 to 20 percent of the carbon, and nothing on that methane. Ozone. We've just found out that our ozone problem caused half, half of the environmental harm caused to planet Earth in the last 50 years was ozone. Ozone hasn't gone away. The levels uh, that of ozone that uh, are not reduced by uh, these other new technologies. Ozone is a really serious problem. And ozone is not one of the seven life cycle emissions that are supposed to be included in our pollution tax. Oops. I mean, the only one we saw reasonably was chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs. And we did it because we didn't do it, mankind ended. We were motivated. But the reality is, and this is the real shame of all of this. You know me, Jim. I've been fighting for ammonia energy for 40 years. If anybody had listened 40 years ago, or guess what, 20 years before that in the 1960s, when the U.S. government did all the research on ammonia energy, if anybody had actually listened to the basic, basic math and science, we wouldn't be where we are today. The, the research that we did at the University of Ontario in the last seven years, six, seven, five, six years, <coughs> proved one thing beyond any doubt, that when you use ammonia with fossil fuels by again cleaning them by turning the CO2 from natural gas that you use to make ammonia into a viable product instead of venting it by using microwave or other technologies below ground to strip the hydrogen out of tar sands and leave everything else in the ground and take the hydrogen and add it to nitrogen and get ammonia and ship that in existing pipelines. You know, these are all technologies that exist and that are in use today. Alberta, they invented a wonderful technology to make hydrogen from tar sands 100% pollution free. And where's the first place in the world they're going to try the technology? In Alberta's tar sands? Nope, in Venezuela. Like, come on. So 
we have lots of technologies and lots of ways to make very, very big reductions in the impact from pollution, from the production and use of energy. We don't do them, and we're not going to do them until we reach the catastrophic point, because you're absolutely right. Mankind is not proactive. We don't see things coming and deal with it. We're reactive. We wait until it's an absolute catastrophe, and then we go, oh, geez, maybe we should do something about that. And so that's really where we're at. And we're at that point now, okay? And, 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 and the lies that the wildfires in Australia were caused by global warming, and the lies that the world's temperature is, rise, is doubling everywhere at the same time, and the bullshit from the Greens, is sustaining the bullshit from the fossil fuel industry. Because they point and say, look, I got a grade five science student here that proves you're full of shit. So, again, oh, Greta. You remember when the US, uh, who was he said, you should study economics? He was right, he's right. Because your basic math and your basic science don't do it. It's just not true. And again, I mean, and you know that I'm not an anti fucking green. I'm the original green. I was the guy that did an ammonia car, drove it across Canada in 1981, got on Parliament Hill with the Governor General on Constitution Day. You know, two years later, the Toronto Star science reporter, Jack Miller, who'd written about us, wrote a great article. When, uh, when the NOAA released the first greenhouse gas study. And there I was on the phone saying, did you see it? Everything we've been saying is true. This was in 1983. Can you imagine if the Green Party had campaigned on ammonia in 1983? Do you know that I never campaigned on ammonia as a Green? Because it was never party policy. You know, the first time I used ammonia, and a quote from the Governor General, was when I ran as a Mike Harris conservative in 1990. And I changed all my campaign literature instead of red and blue to green and blue. And at the convention, I won the award for the best campaign science, but they had to take it away from me because I violated the party constitution that said you could only use red and blue, and I used red and green. I was the first candidate that ever ran for office in Canada that had neon green in the back of his campaign signs. Long before the late liberal did it in 2000 and whatever, okay? So I was the original green Tory and I got a standing ovation at that, con at, at that convention for going against the party line. But again, Jim, what happened? Mike Harris got a majority, that's what happened. And it was over. I helped Dalton McGinty. I was the guy at a meeting at Harbor 60 with Dalton and Jerry Botts, Peter Regenstreet, the conservative and liberal strategist, Murray McLaughlin, the singer. And we convinced Dalton to run on PR and campaign in favor of it. And he said, I'll campaign in favor of it. And he ran in the election saying he'd have a referendum and he'd campaign in favor of it. And what happened? He got a big majority. He changed the threshold to 60%, and then he told everybody they'd have to double the amount of M MPPs. But he never ran on that. The same with Mike. He got his majority, promised a citizen referendum law, so that I and all that follow will have to keep their promises. What happened? He got an 82C majority. So these things don't happen uh, until the very survival of the political party is at stake. And we're not there yet. Well, what if it takes us another 100 years to get to that point? Industry, industry will do this. Industry will take the lead on this uh, before the politicians. Industry, money has no moral. Money is a whore who go to whoever will pay her best. And I don't mean that to be sexist or whatever, or him best, okay? Uh, no, no, industry will do this because there is enough social pressure in a lot of uh, wealthy countries uh, that are making some very big mistakes that are now starting to pay for them. And a good example of that, for example, is Germany. 
Germany's blown a trillion and a half dollars in the last 20 years on its green plan. And now where are they? Well, they closed their nuclear plants after Fukushima. Now what are they doing? Well, they got 38 nuclear, or sorry, 72 coal-fired gas plants, and they're closing them too in 2038. Why? Because all of this renewable, variable, off-peak, non-sustainable energy that everybody says will save the world cost more than twice as much as any other form of energy because for every watt of renewable, you got to have a watt of, wait for it, wait for it, coal or nuclear backup power. Ooh. So, and what are the economics? Well, because it's so variable, you got to build two for one. And it doesn't matter how well you grid manage, you're going to blow steam in that nuclear plant, or you're going to gate water at the hydro plant because you must take that renewable energy. That's why Ontario's energy costs have doubled in the last 10 years. And that's why notwithstanding the chicanery that Kathleen Wynne did and is being sustained by Doug Ford, the global adjustment cost is going to double the price of energy again in the next 10 years. And then in the next 20 years after that, to pay for the loans because we pushed the debt from the global adjustment down the road, it's going to double it again. Why? Because you're paying 20 cents kilowatt to generate energy. You can't use it on the grid, so you're paying two cents kilowatt for someone to take it from you, please. You're now at 22 cents. You've paid for the base load nuclear power and you're venting steam. You've paid to build the hydro capacity and you're gaining water. And so what are we paying this year? $4.5 billion more in Ontario for our electricity than it costs us to generate it. Why? Green energy subsidy. <laughs> Period. The whole thing. And now they're keeping pickering open? Why? Because they're going to refurbish Darlington. And they don't have the base load capacity when they need it. This is a nightmare. This is a disaster. This is what happens when you have a bunch of dope, smoking, eco-fascists decide your economic and energy policy without asking a five-year-old or a grade five even to do any analysis. What did both Auditor General's reports in 2011 and 2014 find from two different Auditor General? The government did all of these policies in a vacuum. They made all of these decisions with absolutely no economic analysis. All the claims of employment were based on bullshit. He used a different word. Okay, please. And that's the problem. And, and it don't change whoever your government is. Next, isn't this a positive show we're having? <laughs> Uh, come on over, we'll get a rope and hang ourselves in the closet together, holding hands. Well, that leads me to the next, you know, uh, looming question is what gets China and India and the big countries on board that are just, they don't care, they're just producing product? And I mean, does that kind of fall in line with uh, the business and corporate responsibility? Do you know what happens when you get five million upset Chinese citizens? You know what happens when you get 10% of the population of India upset? Uh, the last time that happened, I think they called it in France, let them eat cake. We're beyond the point of economic disparity that caused the French Revolution. We're beyond the point of economic disparity uh, that caused the Russian Revolution. People have less resources than less wealth and earn less for their effort today 
than they did in the 1930s in the crash. Grade five math, grade five science. Economics is not hard, it's kind of simple. It works like this. On one end, you have government spending. On the other end, you have wealth generation. Taxes. And you got the teeter totter. And if you lower government spending, you gotta get money into the economy. You gotta. And so we said, no, no, no. What we'll do is we'll lower taxes. And then all these people will invest their money, and that'll, do, that'll make it up. And then we lower taxes. They didn't fuck off. They, they took all the money. They did share buybacks. They didn't increase wages at all. They used the capital gains exemption. The rich took their piles of gold and they hoarded it. And so all of this money that was on this side of the economy, which was supposed to go back in the economy, is gone. <gasps> oh, Jesus. Oh, now we got to increase government spending then. Right? And so what do you got? Oh, oh the deficit's $2.1 trillion this year. <laughs> oh, now we got to cut government spending. Are we going to cut taxes? Are we going to raise taxes? No, no, no. We're going to cut. Medicare, we're going to cut education, and we're going to cut basic pensions and basic social services. And they still can't balance this. So now the government said, we got to inject capital into the market. So they've injected $70 trillion into the market in overnights in the last 90 days so that there's cash in the economy. Because all the rich have got all their money hidden in bags and it's not in the economy. And as Henry Ford said, the reason I doubled the wages of my workers is they can't afford to buy the cars they're building. And that grade nine, grade five student in math and science who's done economics says, this can't work. You have got to, for every dollar you take out of the economy in tax cuts or incentives, or you've got to put a dollar back in somewhere. And that's where we're at. We're down at the bottom on both sides. And the only thing that's sustaining us, our economy from total collapse, is the government money, taxpayers' money, that's being thrown into the financial system, blasted in the blast furnace. And if you look at economics and capitalism, the way it's supposed to work is when these banks go under, we own them. We ended up with AIG. We ended up with Chrysler. We ended up with GM. Oh, but we don't end up with any of the banks we're rescuing. And we've now provided, you know, a hundred trillion dollars in loans to these banks in overnights and other things. And we don't own them. So, you know, it's, again, it's like I say, you know, you, you, the, the, the system cannot sustain no revenue from tax cuts and no revenue from wages and, and, and tax from wages. And it used to be that 60%, you had a 60% corporate rate and income tax rate, and the percentage of revenue that was made, raised by, for government by wages was nothing. You know, it was 10%. Now it's the other way. And what do the conservatives say? Well, we got to get rid of those entitlements. And now you got a genius running for the conservative leadership that says, we want a 15% a 15 personal income tax and no corporate tax. Well, okay, and if he gets elected and wins a majority government, there will be no medical care, no health care, no public education, nothing. No old age pensions, nothing. Because it's you gotta pay for it. And the IMF will come in, as it does in other countries. You know, say, okay, here's the austerity program. You want to borrow the money to pay the interest on the debt? Okay, great. 
Give us Here's what you cancel and cancel and cancel and cancel and cancel and cancel. So get out there and join the conservative party and vote in the leadership. Please. <sighs> <laughs> All right, I want to keep you on time, brother. We have already done an hour. Uh, I know this is, have you ever fantasized of it? Like if you, the order of, if you were King Vez and you came in, let's just, just concentrate on Canada. You could come in and you can change any, you can change anything you wanted, anywhere you wanted, you know. You, Do you I get just mind, one change? You don't want everyone to collapse. You don't want riots in the streets. And no, no, no. I get one change? Just one? No, you no. My no first change, I, would, I can I'd do anything interested. I want. I'd be interested in the first thing you did. And first then, thing I would do oh, is yeah, I yeah. pass Mike Harris's municipal and provincial referenda bill as drafted. We went to the committee. We got almost unanimous consent of the committee. We had all the parties in favor. There's only three or four people that weren't in favor. Let's see. Uh, the leader of the Conservative Party, Mike Harris, wasn't in favor. Uh, the Liberal the liberal Leader Party, Lynn McLeod, wasn't in favor. Uh, the leader of the NDP, Bob Ray, wasn't in favor. Oh, and out of 101 or 103 MPPs, we only had three that were against. That's right. <laughs> the party leaders. Okay. So, so first thing I would do is I pass a citizen referendum. Okay. Order. Explain that a little bit. That means that the public can have a vote on any subject they want. Now you have rules, you need signatures and blah, 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 blah. But you can't have a vote on something that violates someone's constitutional rights. You have to change the constitution to do that if you want to violate their constitutional rights. That's a lot harder. Um, but you know, you have a petition. So, you know, like a, like, like carbon tax, we're gonna have a vote on yes or no on the carbon tax. Or, uh, you know, or yes or no or maybe, you know. But anyway, you have a vote on it and you have, a, well, it has to be a clear question. Uh, and the public, if the, and the, and the public initiates and go get signatures and if they, you know, have the original 200 sponsors and the thing goes to the attorney general that checks and makes sure it, you know, it's constitutional. It's a real legit question, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, you go get signatures. And once it's certified, then the government has one chance to get rid of it. And what they have to do is they have to go get a hundred of at least 101 of the 200 original sponsors of the referendum and get them to accept something different that the government introduces. And so it allows the politicians to do what they do and broker interests and go part way. So they won't give you everything you asked for, but I'll give you a part of what you asked for. And we've guaranteed to pass it through the House within 12 months. And if it passes through the House, there's no referendum on that subject until after the next election. If it doesn't pass through the House, it's on the ballot in 12 months. It's because there is a reason to have representative democracy and there is a reason to have politicians. But there's no reason to have them if they're not representing us and they're only representing themselves. So let politicians be politicians. Let them be honest. Let them broker different interests and come up with a, a consensus that's not perfect for everybody, but at least sort of gets us part of what we wanted. So if, if I could do the one thing, I would change us from representative democracy to more direct democracy. And that's not saying we'd have a referendum every day or anything. That's just saying on the big issues where the public, where the politicians won't do what the public want or where they're doing things the public don't want, the public can say, okay, enough. We've got enough. And that right exists in the United States. The public in the United States has the right using referenda to overrule the U.S. Constitution and to overrule the U.S. Supreme Court. Duh. So if I could change everything, what would I change? The second thing, I would eliminate all uh, campaign contributions entirely, and I would go to 100% public funded. I would get everybody a $100 tax credit, political tax credit, that they could donate to parties or independents or whoever else they want and split it up however they want. And if you didn't donate it, then those that didn't donate, that fund would go to the Democracy Educational Foundation, uh, to show people how to vote for none of the above, you know, to show we put the kind of ballot on the ballot. So if you didn't put your hundred dollars towards a political party or movement, your hundred dollars goes to an educational movement that educates people about democracy. 
and there would be no political contributions, there would be no fundraisers. Uh, I would make parties be democratic. I would make them have a constitution. I would make them have appeal processes. I would have a final appeal to the courts. I would not let leaders interfere in local nominations. And I would move the party names from the ballot. I'd go back to just having the name of the person that we're going to elect, except in a PR system. And my PR system is different than everybody else's. Mine has half the seats elected party, and the parties run candidates on a list. And whichever candidate gets the highest percentage of the vote gets the seats, not someone 37 names down the list you never heard of. The second is the other vote for your local representative. There's no party names. And half the house is full of independents. Half the house is full of party members. And you need 66% to pass a bill, which means you need all of the party side and some of the independents, or all of the independents and some of the party side to get a bill passed. That would get rid of partisan politics because people's interests, the vast majority uh, of people's interests in politics until they get elected is doing the right thing. <laughs> it's, it's only once you get elected that doing the right thing changes. Doing the right thing no longer becomes doing what people elected me for and solving. Right. Doing the right thing is what the whip tells me I have to do to make sure that I have enough members in my riding association and I raise enough money so I get an exempted nomination and I can get my seat again. Because mm -hmm. that's where we are, right? So we're not a democracy anymore. There's no democracy in any parties, including the Greens. Look at the leadership. 50 grand to run. It only costs 30 grand to run for Jagmeet Singh's job, for Christ's sake. And the NDP is a lot bigger than the Green Party. And there's appeal process. What appeal process? The party can say, no, you're not running. They can say no reason. Exactly like the Conservatives, exactly like the Liberals, exactly like the NDP. The Green Party is just another follow the leader of the slaughterhouse party. It hasn't learned a goddamn thing since I left it and since you left it. There. <laughs> How do we get a hold of you, Vez? What do you put? Uh, Where's your website? Uh, what are you doing? Greg Vesna for Green Party leader. The website will be up Monday. <laughs> JimFannon.ca. I'm running for. <laughs> <laughs> Send uh, patreon.com slash free speech <laughs> that's where the uh and you have to find out for me if i raise the 50 g's or i don't raise the if i raise 49 g's what happens to all the money they keep it <laughs> it's Hello, called brother. it's called you snooze you lose okay <laughs> you made a deposit in the car the car came in we sold the car to our brother-in-law for half <laughs> the price and we're suing you for the difference oh no no i'm sorry that's your house we sold your house using the bank's real estate agent from the real estate company the bank owns mm -hmm. to the branch manager's sister for half the price. And now we're suing you for the other half. Right, right. That's it. That's the Green Party post. Email, website, social media. Where are we, where are we find you? I know you're everywhere. Uh, GregVesna.com. There's nothing there. Uh, NH3Fuel.com. That's where everything we have about ammonia energy. Uh, and NOTA, N-O-T-A dot C-A for none of the above for the none of the above party of Ontario and Canada. And on that, if you click on um, contact or news, up will come a link to read or download free my book, Democracy A. Oh yeah, nice. Yeah, so you can get it free now. You don't have to buy it on Amazon. You can buy it on Amazon if you like. Well, you uh, I did a walk around Port Luzi today. I did a live stream. I said 85, but I think it was, what was it, 93, 92? When was that book? 1993. Before the election, we published the book. Oh, in, really? uh, we published the book in uh, uh, August, and the election was September. What do you think about Elections Canada coming after Ezra and Re Rebel Lo News telling them that uh, Lebrano's was a uh, was a campaign contribution or he was electioneering or something? <laughs> well, you know, Elections Canada or the Chief Electoral Officer or the Commissioner of Canada Elections, depending on what day of the week, or the all claim that they're independent and they do the job and they're not partisan. And every one of them has proven on more than more than one occasion that the exact opposite. And we had one in the Green Party. You remember during Clay Quat Sound. They were arresting people. And the judge was fining people 12, 1500, 2000 dollars 
Bob Ray went out there and got arrested. I got a call from Stuart Parker out there, I think was at the time leader of the BC Dream. Uh, and he said, can, can you help raise, help us raise money? And I said, well, why don't we accept contributions designated to pay fines? And so we did a press release and put up on the, uh, we didn't have a website back then, but we did a press release and told the whole world that uh, you could contribute to the Green Party of Canada for Claquan Sound and pay the fines of people being arrested. And even people that were arrested could contribute to the party, get the tax receipt and pay the fines. So I got this threatening letter from Elections Canada, how designated contributions were illegal, blah, 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 blah. So I replied, the Green Party is part of and has been of the Clay Quat Sound protest movement since its inception. It is our political activity. And these are our party members in many cases being arrested. We will pay the fines for anybody who is arrested at Clay Quat Sound. And I dare you to try and do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> they never heard anything again. Now, the fact of the matter is, is it was actually a Supreme Court of Canada decision on this that came just after. And that was the guy that ran the rhinoceros party, Blair Longley, uh, had, had, uh, had people give contributions so that they could pay themselves a salary to be campaign workers. Mm. And they were the... The contributor was the direct beneficiary of the contribution. And, and Revenue Canada said no way. And Blair went to the Supreme Court. Uh, and, and, and he won the designated contributions were legal, except where it was clear the contributor was a direct beneficiary. So you couldn't have a raffle for a bike, have the contributor donate the bike, and then award the bike to the contributor. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, because the contributor was the direct benefit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if the contributor bought a ticket, then he could do it. But you couldn't you couldn't do it indirectly, you had to do it directly. So so anyway, you know, they were they were dead on that. And uh, in Ontario they actually changed the law to say that. There's actually in Ontario law there's now a provision about designated contributions. So so yeah, so you know what we did was we used the system against the system. You know there. Mm. Well, and now I guess Ezra's suing the RCMP or whoever the Vancouver Police Department. Who knows it? Richmond Hill? I don't know who he's. He just filed a lawsuit uh, yesterday for assault. One of the the police officers knocked one of his reporters to the ground. But I thought it was interesting when he posted that video that they told him not to take in the federal building that it was uh, illegal, it was, uh, it was not allowed for him to record a conversation in there. Then he videotaped these two ex-RCMP yeah. agents yeah. Yeah. going yeah. after him as uh, uh, Elections Canada. And uh, it was just great, I'm so glad he taped it because no one would believe that that stuff goes on like that. Well, he's got a second tape coming out today or tomorrow, Does he? the second half, oh yeah, there's more to this. Oh. But look, look, this is exactly the same uh, brown shirt stuff, okay? The liberals are famous for. They're famous for claiming they believe in equality, but rigging the tax credit system so that it's non-refundable, so that only wealthy white males get public money to win nominations. Oh, but we're feminists, yeah. And, and what ridings do the women candidates who won liberal nominations win them in? They won them in the ridings where there wasn't already an incumbent. <laughs> and how did they get campaign money? Well, they went to the Judy LaMarche Fund and the four boys that ran it gave them five grand each. Give me a break, okay? Mike Harris, the Harrisite, made tax credits for political contributions refundable in 2000. Why? He said because it discriminated against women, it discriminated against poor, it discriminated against minorities, it discriminated against seniors, it discriminated against young people. How many of Mike Harris's contributors didn't get the credit? They all got it. How many of the Green Party's contributors didn't get it? None of them got it. In fact, in, 2000, in 2011 and 12, 
just over 50% of the federal political contribution tax credits were claimed. More than 10% of them were claimed by people who didn't qualify and they didn't fucking know they qualified. Revenue Canada had to give them their notice of assessment and say, oh, by the way, here's the act. This is on the party website. Oops, it's not on the party website. It says you get a tax credit. It doesn't say it's non-refundable and it doesn't say that unless you're wealthy, you don't get it, but okay. What percentage in Ontario claimed the tax credit? In 2011-12, 100%. Every single person who qualified claimed it. Now it's down to 99.98, but whatever, okay? So the biggest barrier to entering politics is money. And if you don't think it's money, then you're, okay? And the biggest barrier to women and disabled and seniors, money. So if my, I get together with all my seniors in the, in the old folks home and we, we contribute our hundred dollars and we don't fucking have dessert for a year, we don't get our $75 back. But if I run that seniors home and I'm paying minimum wages and I contribute a hundred dollars, I get 75 back. I love capitalism. It's a great system. The only thing worse than capitalism is socialism. And the only thing worse than socialism is Canada. <laughs> oh, what well, I got to end it there, but you can't end it on a better uh, sound bite than that. All right, brother. All right, Jimmy. I appreciate Thank you. the time. All right, we'll talk soon. Okay, Love bye. Sure. Let's see how to work this thing. Stop video. Don't you do it? Yeah. Are you go oh no, I'll just stop my video. End call. Yeah, I'll start. <laughs> End meeting. End meeting for